The spookiest thing about this past Halloween is how much time I had to spend researching this video. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Launch. Halloween is one of America's favorite holidays and probably one of the more universally celebrated ones between America and Canada. It's a day characterized by jack-o'-lanterns, mischief, and door-to-door -door solicitation. Most of us probably have memories of dressing up like a cowboy or a bumblebee and then toddling around the neighborhood, or at the very least we recognize the theme music of the movie Halloween, which is about Michael Myers. And not to get serious on you too early in the video, but we are hearing rumors that kids this Halloween didn't really get to trick-or-treat quite as much because of some weird thing called trunk or treat that was going around? Take your kids door to door. Just, just do it, it's fun. You got to do it, they should get to do it too. Of course, Halloween is not a solely American holiday. It has a number of traditions that date back to medieval Europe. These customs and traditions were associated with a Christian holiday called All Saints Day. And the night before All Saints Day was All Hallows Eve. Hallow being a term for, for holy and the holies, the saints, is kinda, it's, you get where this all happened. Yet there are those who suggest that the traditions which make up Halloween are far older and a lot less Christian than we think. And speaking of shortening things, one thing I need to do is shorten my research time, and a great tool for doing that is today's sponsor, our partner, Mindgrasp AI. Now, Mindgrasp is an AI productivity tool, and in the past, I have been very cautious when it comes to using AI tools. I have actually advised against using certain ones, but this is not quite what you might be thinking. With Mindgrasp, I can use it to upload my own notes, and then I can ask it specific questions about what exactly I wrote. And that allows me to streamline that re-research process significantly, which cuts hours and hours of time out of my workday. And what's really nice is that if we're looking at something really big, a, a compilation, a meta-analysis like we did with Missing 411 a few months back, Mindgrasp allows me to upload huge files. So whether I want information from one of my hour-long YouTube videos or a 200-page text document, Mindgrasp can handle all of that. And if I am looking for new information, maybe something that is tangentially related to what I'm researching, I can actually just go ask it to search the web for information, and it won't just return me an answer. It will give me actual sources and actual references that I can then go read myself. Essentially, Mindgrasp can do stuff that I have hired human beings with master's degrees to do for me in the past. So whether you're looking to streamline your productivity for academics, your workplace, or just your interests, Mindgrasp could be a really helpful tool for you. And if you want to try it out, you can just head down to the link in our description and see for yourself. But before we get into that, let's talk about what we mean when we say Halloween, because we've got to talk about some concrete version of this holiday, and we're going to do that using the American version that I remember. There are a few primary traits that make up the American Halloween holiday, and those include costumes, trick-or-treating, jack-o'-lantern carving, and of course the date of October 31st. And yes, there's a lot of things with haunted houses and scary movies and all of that, but that all kind of rolls into the costuming in my opinion. It's also more associated with the spooky aspect of Halloween than any of the religious aspects from either side. The name of the holiday, Halloween, comes from All Hallows' Eve, and specifically in the Scottish dialect, where it was not shortened to Eve, but rather even. Eventually, the All and part of the Hallows were dropped and you just got Halloween. And All Hallows' Eve isn't so much its own holiday as it is a vigil in preparation for All Saints' Day. The thing is, that dating of November 1st, along with some of the traditions, have led people to claim that this is not actually derived from All Saints' Day, but rather from a Celtic holiday called Samhain. The idea being that when the Christians swept into Britain and Ireland, they simply Christianized, they reframed this holiday into something that was not observant of gods, but observant of saints. So in order to determine whether Halloween has Christian or pagan roots, we need to talk about what Halloween is, how it's celebrated, and when those celebrations came in. Looking at All Saints Day first, the details on how it is celebrated and what precisely you're actually celebrating vary from sect to sect. But the general consensus is that you are giving thanks and prayers to the saints, those who have died, those who were martyred in Christendom. In some cases, this only applies to the canonized saints and martyrs, but in others, with my sect, Methodism for example, we view all departed Christians as saints. 
And this disconnect actually led to the creation of All Souls Day on November 2nd, which is celebrated in sects that don't have that Methodist opinion, and sometimes it's not even celebrated at all, but we'll get into that. In the sects that do celebrate both All Saints Day and All Souls Day, All Saints Day is reserved for kind of that class of saints and martyrs, and then the next day you give prayers to all the souls. And in Western Christianity, keep in mind the Western Christian churches and the Eastern Christian churches use different religious calendars. In Western Christianity, All Hallows' Eve is October 31st, All Saints' Day is November 1st, and All Souls' Day is November 2nd. If we then move over to look at what Samhain is, what they're observing, that's different. Samhain was and is one of the four primary Gaelic festivals celebrating the changing of the seasons. And these are likely part of a broader Celtic practice overall. These festivals include Imbolc on February 1st, Beltana on May 1st, Lugnaza on August 1st, and then of course Samhain on November 1st. In this case, seasonal changes were more related to agriculture and pastoralism than they were the position of Earth on its axis. Today, of course, we look at the equinoxes and the solstices. They looked more in terms of the harvest, and that makes a lot of sense. The solstice, the equinox, would not have meant a ton to these people. When you needed to plant, that made more sense. Now, of course, these two are inextricably related, but they, they probably didn't know that considering they didn't have an idea of the Earth being on an axis. So Samhain marks the end of the harvest season and the beginning of the winter season. And historically, these celebrations were associated with the Celtic Otherworld, this being a time when the veil between our realm and the realm of the Fey Folk was at its thinnest. During this time, travel between our world and theirs was a lot easier, and oftentimes not to the benefit of humanity. And according to the Wooing of Emmer, a medieval Celtic legend, the Samhain festival may have also been observed as something of a New Year's celebration. But real quick, we need to talk about how Irish mythology, the Celtic belief system, have been passed down and recorded. The Wooing of Emmer is preserved in multiple medieval manuscripts, but probably dates to about the 10th century or as early as the 8th. Now, part of the reason that the first written versions of these stories we have are so recent is that the Druids preferred to pass things down through oral tradition rather than a written language. And that's not to say that the Irish and the Celts as a whole didn't have any writing system. There were a couple. One was called Ohm, and it appears to have been based off of uh, actual hand symbols because it always seems to use five lines across a vertical line. And on the mainland, there were Celts who used the Greek alphabet to write things down. Also, just as a quick little aside, there's this belief, uh, this, this popular belief that druids were this shadowy, secretive, you know, super paranormal organization of people, and that's, that's not quite accurate. Druids would have performed a number of roles, including the priestly role, but also were likely legal mediators, doctors, and other sort of professional roles. Point being, we just don't have any good written original Irish pagan resources to look at this material. Most of what we have was written down by Christian monks, and it did get a little Christianized in the process, but it does give us some good clues about those Irish beliefs. And before we go any further, I need to give some context for some of the terms that are going to be used for the rest of the video. So we're about to talk about the Celtic, the Irish origin story, the Leverkvalna Erin, the Leverkvalna Erin, there we go, that we've talked about in the past. So if you're not interested in sitting through that again, you can just skip to the next chapter of this video. If you haven't seen that stuff before, you might want to stay. Basically, if the terms Tua de Danon and Book of Invasions sound really familiar to you, then you can probably go ahead. Much of Irish mythology deals with how the Gaels interacted with these supernatural beings, the Tua de Danon. And generally, scholars have come to the conclusion that these are most likely the Irish gods who were relegated to a minor status of being supernaturally gifted or magicians or possibly even angels later by the Christians who were writing these things down. This is supported by the fact that a lot of continental and British Celtic names for deities are cognate and also share functions with the Irish ones. For example, there's Lug and Lugus, Bridget and Brigantia, Nuada and Nodons, and Ogna and Ogmios. So as you can see, lots of similarities between the Irish, which was the first one I gave you there, and the continental or the uh, Britannic. And like I said, scholars generally consider these to have been the pre-Christian gods, but it's not quite that simple. Their story might be more complicated than that. The legend of the Tua de Danon survives in multiple forms, and their origin story was passed down in the Leva Gavala na Erin, the Book of Invasions. The direct translation, of course, there is the Book of the Takings of Ireland, and this goes over the six times that new people came into Ireland. 
and it's compiled from a bunch of manuscripts that all date to about the 11th century and are probably based off of older material. While it attempts to accurately retell the history of Ireland, it is pretty heavily Christianized and it's broadly inaccurate to what we know now. Nonetheless, it does include valuable clues about how the Irish perceived their history. And it also gives valuable hints regarding the folk beliefs of those ancient Irish. It begins with the story of humanity according to Genesis, with Noah's son Japheth being the father of the Europeans, his son Magog being the forebearer of the Scythians, and Magog's son Phineas Farsed the forebearer of the Gaels. Now when you're reading this, you gotta read between the lines, because when they say Scythians, that's probably not referring to the people the ancient Greeks were referring to. But by the time anybody was writing about these guys, the Gaels were already in Ireland and their ancestors had long been in Iberia. Iberia, of course, referring to the region that we call today Spain and Portugal. So looking at this, the use of the term Scythians makes me wonder if this is sort of a vague memory of the Yamnaya culture who crossed over from that region into Europe some 5,000 years ago during the Copper Age. But while this is a story about Ireland, the Gaels aren't going to be relevant for a while, so we're going to skip past them for a bit. The first people to arrive in Ireland are led by a person named Caesar, who is supposedly a grandchild of Noah via Noah's son Bith. Now, no such son of Noah named Bith is actually recorded in the Bible, and this seems like it was likely an attempt to connect the Irish to the ancient Israelites. This happens. But the way it goes is that Noah basically instructed Caesar to go to Ireland to escape the flood for some reason. Caesar takes three ships to Ireland, only two make it, and only 53 people survive, and then all of them die in the flood anyway, except for our boy Finton the Salmon. <laughs> Finton! <laughs> Finton pulls an epic pro-gamer move by becoming an immortal salmon and living for 5,000 years to recount this story to a later Irish king. After this disaster with Caesar, Ireland is uninhabited for about 300 years until a guy named Partholon leads a thousand men and women there. The Book of Invasions gives their itinerary as follows. They came from Scythia via Gothia, traveled through Anatolia, Greece, Sicily, then Iberia, and then when they finally reached Ireland, they multiplied to 4,000 men and 5,000 women. Sorry, 5,000 men and 4,000 women. You may recognize this as a much better ratio than any frat party. The unfortunate part is that they all died of a plague except one guy. Following this, we have the people of Nemed or Nimek. These are more descendants of Noah via the Scythians, which could just be referring again to that vague memory of the Yamnaya culture and the ancient Indo-Europeans. They set off from the Black Sea in 44 ships, and again, only one of them reaches Ireland. It contains Nebed, his four sons, his wife, and a number of others. And things are going okay for them, except there's the part where they have to battle mysterious Fomorians, who their description kind of changes throughout the Celtic stories. But what we do know is that these Fomorians have a tower out in the sea, and the Nemedians go to war with them. They fight valiantly, and they actually do win, but it's one hell of a Peric victory because they end up having to leave. They only have 30 men left, and that's just not enough to sustain an entire population. That's actually below the necessary number of people for uh, non-problematic reproduction, so to speak. According to this version of the story, some of these people went to Britain, some went to Greece, and others just went north. Now, why would somebody writing in the 9th century claim that a group of people went north? Well, they did know about Iceland, and there was also this mystical place called Thule that was described by uh, the Greek traveler Pythias. We don't know exactly what he meant when he was talking about Thule. It could have been Iceland, it could have been parts of Norway. Some have even suggested it was only the Faeries Islands. But either way, those who went to Greece had a bit of a problem, which was that they were immediately enslaved. For the next 230 years, they would work as laborers carrying soil and clay to help the Greeks terraform, apparently. Uh, and the, the, as a result, because of the sacks they carried full of dirt and clay, they became known as the Fear Bolg, or Men of the Sack. Eventually, they managed to escape back to Ireland, which they then divide into five territories. They prosper for a time, but then a new race appears, the Tua de Danon. These Tua de Danon are supposedly the descendants of Nemed who went north, and they have come back, and they have come back with supernatural abilities, and they use those supernatural abilities to fight the Fearbolg. Their name, Tua de Danon, translates to children of the goddess Danu, and whatever their relationship with this goddess Danu, it seems that it was everything they needed to overcome these Fearbolg. And it wasn't just that they defeated the Fearbolg, they then went to war with the Fomorians and won. And this wasn't a victory in the sense that the Nemedians had a victory. This was a victory where the Tuatha Dé Danann decisively won that battle. 
And this is where the Gaels finally re-enter the picture, heading from Iberia to Ireland. These people are called Milesians at the time, probably from Mil Espanye, which means soldier of Spain, but they are skilled warriors, and they defeat both the Tua de Danon and the Fomorians who ally together to fight them. After they wrest control of Ireland from the Tua de Danon, they become the rulers of that land, and eventually they are known as the Gaels. Now, it's important to note a few things about the Book of Invasions, because there are earlier accounts of these stories that don't quite match. One example would be Historia Britannum by the monk Nennius. It was written around 828 AD, and it does describe some of these invasions. The thing is, he only recounts three of these, those of Partholon, Nemed, and the Milesians. This would suggest that the story of the Tua de Danon was not originally part of the story of the takings of Ireland. It existed independently of that and was eventually rolled in. In Nennius' version of accounts, Partholon's people number only 4,000 before the plague. They're also the first to land in Ireland, Caesar being completely absent from the story, and they're not from Scythia, they're from Iberia. Similarly, Nennius' version does not have Nemid coming from Scythia, traveling through the Mediterranean, and then up the coast to Ireland. He simply starts in Iberia. When they leave, they don't go north, they don't go to Britain, and they don't go to Greece, they go back to Iberia. So it seems like in 828, the two a day were not involved in the narrative, and this idea that there was this long link back to the Indo-Europeans had not been included in the story. Rather, they were probably going based off of these people's most recent location, where, where their ancestors came from, would have been Iberia. Where those people in Iberia came from, well, you know, that's anyone's guess in 828, or even in the 11th century. But in any case, the Milesians do defeat the Alliance, they do take control of Ireland, and they do force the Tua Dei into the other world. Now, this is something of, a, of an agreement that the Tua Dei get the other world, and we get this world. But something that's important to note is that the other world is not the same concept as the underworld. A lot of the time we like to think of these realms of spiritual beings in this sort of Christian lens, where there's a heaven and there's a hell, there's a paradise and there's an underworld. This, of course, even goes back into things like the Greeks believing in an underworld. Now, the Irish, not so much. The Celts had a different concept entirely. It did still sometimes involve going underground, but this was not the land this this wasn't the realm of the dead. Now, the realm of the dead was in the other world, but that's it was the whole other world was not the realm of the dead. Travel between our world and the other world, as I mentioned before, is usually managed through these passageways, fairy mounds, also known as seed, or in the modern Irish, she. These could take several forms, but oftentimes they were underground passageways. And though the two a day, the ace, she, and the other fairy folk all live in the other world, around Samhain, they're known to kind of make their way into ours. And one of the times they're more likely to do this would be at Samhain, when the veil was at its thinnest. But I want to be clear, Samhain was not necessarily a time of fear. People weren't boarding up their doors and staying inside hiding. This was also a time of celebration. This was the harvest. This was a festival. This was good times. And a lot of the information about this comes to us from these medieval sources. It could, however, also be a time of danger. For example, the Boyhood Deeds of Finn, which dates to about the 12th century, includes a story about this deity or this to a day called Aelin, who was the burner. He would emerge, he would burn Tara to the ground, and then eventually he's slain by Finn McCool. Finn's story also includes a tale about a fairy woman who lives in a mound, and all of the men in Ireland want to marry her. On Samhain, they would go and try to woo her, and everyone who went, someone in their family would die that year. And supposedly, this was a slang to mark the occasion, and the killer was unknown. Then, in the Colloquy of the Ancients, which dates to the 12th or 13th century, there's a story about a woman who comes out every Samhain, steals the nine best cows from every herd, and takes them back through the seed at Cruachan. And I will say right now, if I get these names wrong, I'm sorry, but Irish does not come out of my mouth very well. This same text refers to three she-wolves who emerge from a cave at Cruachan, and they will just go and eat rams and sheep. These actually turn out to be human beings wearing cloaks and pretending to be wolves, which calls my mind to questions about the Vikings and stories of wild people living as animals in the forests of Europe, but that's a video for another time. An additional bit about Samhain is that the Book of Invasions claims that the Nemedians had to give up two-thirds of their produce, their milk, and even their children to the Fomorians every Samhain. This is actually what leads to that war between the Nemedians and the Fomorians, which the Nemedians win, but at great cost. In the 10th or 11th century work, The Destruction of Dederga's Hostel, High King Connor Moore breaks his taboos and ends up dying on Samhain. And again, if I pronounce that wrong, I, I, it, it looks like it's spelled Conair, but... Conair Quickbead, 
by Conair. Listen, it's probably not pronounced like the Conair Quickbead, but I... Have you ever tried to look up Irish pronunciations? There's like eight different examples and the comments are all Irish people arguing. If I have any Irish viewers who want to like send me a guide to how to pronounce these words, please I am begging you, I would like to improve. But now that I've explained to you kind of what these two holidays are, what's being celebrated, you might be looking at them and asking yourself, how did these ever have anything to do with one another? So to determine the links between the pagan festival of Samhain and the Christian feast of all saints, we have to look beyond the date of October 31st, November 1st, and we have to look past what was being celebrated. We need to look at how it was celebrated. And from there, we can kind of determine where did these customs originate. So let's start with arguably the most recognizable part of Halloween, which is the trick-or-treating. Trick-or-treating has been a North American Halloween custom since at least 1927, when the term was first used in print. The practice of going door-to-door -door asking for sweets, however, is related to an earlier British practice regarding All Saints Day. The custom of souling dates back at least to the Middle Ages, and it generally involved the giving of cakes to the poor. Now, what do we mean by cake here? We're not talking about, uh, you know, like a birthday cake. We're talking about a type of bread. The idea behind this was that if you had the means to purchase or bake the cakes and give them out, then you could help souls get out of purgatory. In some cases, it wasn't the giving of the cake that was the act, but you gave a cake and in exchange, somebody agreed to pray for the souls of your loved ones. Now, if you haven't heard of purgatory, in some Christian sects, this is a middle ground between heaven and hell where those who died without absolution of their sins go to sort of sit in a waiting room. It's never quite clear what purgatory is. It's just that it's neither heaven nor hell. The idea being that after a certain amount of time, your sins would be burned or washed away, or that your living relatives could pray for your soul in order to help you on the path to heaven. Now, was this supposed to be something that you could buy? No, but this is not a good video to get into the ethics or the messed up theology of the medieval Catholic Church. Fun little side note, uh, this year Halloween actually fell on Reformation Day, and ironically, the Reformation is part of the reason that certain Halloween-related practices like souling fell out of favor. Also ironically, uh, most of the stuff that Martin Luther was complaining about actually did get resolved in the Catholic Church over the uh, succeeding centuries, but there was never really any reconciliation because Protestantism had simply developed into its own thing. That's not to say that everything Luther was complaining about has been fixed, but an effort has been made by the Catholic Church. This is, for the record, I am not a Catholic. I have been accused of maybe being too hard on Catholics, and I felt it important to recognize a time when they changed for the better. Moving back into the actual Halloween stuff, though, a reference to begging on Hallowmass is made in Shakespeare's The Two Gentlemen of Verona, which is from 1593. And another even earlier source does confirm the use of soul cakes on this holiday. And according to the 14th century clergyman John Merck, on All Souls Day, the day following All Saints Day, people would purchase cakes and they would give them out to the poor. So we do have some very early references to this. John Merck was writing in 1380. However, he makes no mention of people going door to door, which doesn't necessarily mean the practice hadn't yet developed, but at least he did not record it as such. And Merck, again, writing in 1380, also includes the detail that souling is already an old practice. But how old is old? Is it old enough to come from paganism? We have to look at Samhain and see if a direct connection can be found. Souling, in terms of the motivation, is definitely originally Christian because the Celts didn't have that concept of purgatory. But what about that custom of giving away these baked cakes? I actually could find no evidence that that was part of the Samhain festival. It just doesn't seem to have existed in the Celtic world. Going door to door collecting food for the feast at Samhain may have been a Celtic custom, but that's not necessarily enough to make the direct connection between that and souling. Additionally, souling seems to have begun in England, not in Ireland or Scotland. And then on top of that, there's the complicated relationship between the Gaelic folklore and Christianity, because it wasn't quite as adversarial in the mind of the average person as you might expect. Many Gaelic folk legends survived for centuries alongside Christianity because of this belief that fairies and Jesus are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can believe that both exist at the same time. And to be honest, I'm not entirely inclined to disagree with them, but then again, I am of Irish descent. Now, interestingly enough, the earliest references to Samhain involving anything akin to trick-or-treating come from the 16th century, around the exact same time that William Shakespeare was saying it was a part of All Souls Day or All Saints Day. 
So we know that people were dressing up in costume and going door to door for All Saints Day or All Souls Day at least as early as the 1500s, and some scholars have suggested that they would be going in costumes that would have been meant to make them look like the Tua de Denan. And supposedly, these imposters would ask for gifts, and the idea was that you were tricking people into thinking you actually were the Tua de Denan. And the thing is, there's really nothing showing that in any of the legends. There's no mention of going door to door collecting stuff. I looked, I read through so many Celtic texts, and I just cannot find anything about going door to door asking for treats on Samhain specifically. All Saints Day and All Souls Day, yes. So in this case, I'm giving the point to Christianity. But regardless of whether these people who were going out and trick-or-treating were celebrating All Saints Day or Samhain, they probably weren't carrying jack-o'-lanterns way back then. The jack-o'-lantern is as recognizable a symbol of Halloween as any, but it also might be one of the youngest, the term first appearing in print regarding Halloween in the 19th century. Now, where that came from is the real question, because folktales from the 18th century talk about a smith named Jack who made a deal with the devil. There's a number of different ways that the story can go, but the general gist is that Jack traps the devil, and then he forces the devil to promise that Jack's soul will never go to hell. The problem is, Jack goes on to live such a sinful life that he's also not able to get into heaven, and now he's stuck in purgatory and forced to wander about. Now, the story doesn't actually mention purgatory, it just says that he's wandering around between the two, so he may not even be in purgatory, he may be in some entirely separate realm, but the point is that it's dark there. Now, the devil, deciding to be helpful, gives Jack an ember to guide his way, but Jack obviously can't hold an ember in his hand, so he hollows out a turnip and puts the ember inside of the turnip and carries that as a lantern. This would make him Jack of the Lantern, or Jack o' Lantern. But an earlier possibility would be the fact that English Night Watchmen were often referred to colloquially as Jack of the Lantern, Jack o' Lantern. This was because Jack was a very common name for an English man, and they were carrying a lantern. This would be an extremely practical origin for Jack o' Lanterns because it would make sense that kids carrying lanterns from afar might look like Night Watchmen. And then additionally, there's the possibility that it derives from Will o' the Wisps. In the related Celtic culture of the Welsh, Will-o'-the-Wisps are carried by goblins called Puka, who will lead travelers astray into bogs and marshes in the dark of the night, only for them to extinguish their lantern, leaving the traveler stranded. And like the Tuatha or the Ace She, these Puka come from the other world, which is known as Anun in Welsh. Much the same as with the Tuatha, this is the realm of the Tilwith Teg, which is the Fair Family. Once again, if you look at Welsh and Irish, they're both Celtic languages, they're gonna have some similarities, but they're not exactly the same. And in fact, there are a lot of differences between the Gaels and the Britannic Celts that don't just extend to the language, despite the fact that these two groups likely got to the British Isles around the same time. But despite some of the more fine differences, they are broadly similar. Of course, today, Will-o'-the-Wisps are explained as being a natural phenomenon. They're thought to be clouds of phosphine, diphosphine, or methane, which light up as they oxidize. And the part where they would lead people somewhere is usually attributed to how the clouds of gas would move as the air current from you walking forward pushed them. So, in effect, the person following the Will of the Wisp was actually leading the Will of the Wisp while thinking they were following something. But as for Samhain, I could find no references to anybody carrying lit gourds on that holiday. At least, not until the 16th century, but once you do get to the 16th century, they are said to be used to scare away evil spirits. However, the practice of carving and carrying gourds does seem to be original to Ireland and Scotland, and given the fact that there was a Celtic culture there already in Scotland, the Picts, and that the Welsh didn't have this tradition, it seems that the practice of carving and carrying these gourds may in fact go all the way back to before the Irish wrested Scotland from the Picts. This could imply that it actually spread to Wales and Cornwall from Ireland and Scotland, and therefore was not pan-Celtic, but was in fact specific to the Irish. The Scots, of course, were originally Irish immigrants to what is now Scotland. In this case, it seems likely that the jack-o'-lantern did actually emerge from Gaelic folklore, if not Celtic folklore overall, but by the 18th century it had become heavily Christianized. So the lanterns I will give to paganism because, if not directly, then at least by osmosis it does seem to have come from the Irish. 
And this brings us to the costuming aspect, which is probably everyone's favorite part, and also the part most often cited by pagans and evangelicals alike as being original to the Irish folklore, or at the very least as being of non-Christian origin. Known as mumming or guising, the practice of costuming can once again be traced back to Scotland in the 16th century. Now, it may go back further than that, but we don't have any evidence at present. And by the 18th century in Scotland, children would wear masks that they called false faces as they ran about doing their tricks and treats. And this practice of guising is what evolved into the modern costuming tradition. But where did that come from? That one is especially difficult to answer because masks are kind of universal. They're used all over the world and have a number of possible functions, anything from burial to war to religious and drama festivals. To find an answer, I looked to both the legends and the archaeology, and what I found is that there's a lot of sources that claim that costumes were used on Samhain, but none of them actually cite anything. They simply make the claim that masks and costuming originated from Samhain, and then they just kind of move along. So far as I can tell, masks were not universally or consistently involved in any Samhain celebrations, and they also just weren't all that popular amongst the insular Celts of Ireland and Britain. While we do find elaborate ceremonial helms in some cases, they never seem to have masks. And it, it could be that there was a mask and it was made of wood and therefore didn't survive, but we don't have many surviving masks from the Celtic Isles. The one thing that does come to mind is that scene in Colloquy of the Ancients where the three she-wolves reveal that they're in fact human beings dressed as wolves, but that only happens once and it's a pretty loose connection as a result. But part of this issue is that All Saints Day also doesn't carry any use of masks. And in addition to all of that, disguising oneself as one of the two a day by putting on a ghoulish mask would not have made sense to most of the ancient Celts for a number of reasons. From the identity of the two a day and the stories about them, there's just no real evidence that this was a practice related to Samhain. And as I mentioned earlier, Samhain is one of those Celtic quarter days, but Scotland is not only Celtic. So what about the other groups who have inhabited Scotland? The Germanic peoples and the Norse peoples? Well, the practice of guising doesn't seem to have developed in England until after it developed in Scotland, which means it's probably not original to Germanic traditions. Now, that's not to say that there weren't practices of mumming and guising on the continent, but they weren't related to this festival. And if they did somehow make their way into this festival, well, that wouldn't be Celtic paganism, that would be Germanic paganism. But if we look to a group that had really heavily integrated itself into Scottish and Irish culture at around the time that these would have been developing if they were from paganism, then the group that comes to mind is actually the Norse. And while the English and the Norse were ethnically near identical, by the 800s, they had differed considerably. The English had mostly eschewed their pagan roots, while the Norse still wore Thor's hammer. And this pagan aspect of the Viking invaders, the Viking settlers, might have sort of formed a connection with the Scots, who grew up on these stories that the English simply didn't have. If it did come from the Norse, it may not have even come from paganism. It could have come from the berserkers, who would often wear the skins of animals as their battle dress. Now, the Northmen did sometimes wear masks for religious purposes, but there's little evidence to go on, and nothing really suggests that they used them during their celebrations of winter in mid-October. They also did not celebrate on November 1st, they celebrated closer to the middle of the month. And some German nations do seem to have used masks during Yule, but it's unclear if that extended to the Baltic Sea area, and even if it did, it would be the wrong season. Yule, of course, takes place much closer to Christmas. On this one, I don't think I can give the point to either paganism or Christianity, because it seems like it might have been Scottish people drawing on both religions to create something entirely new. And then that just leaves the date, which is arguably the biggest point against Halloween simply being a Christianized Samhain. We don't know when Samhain was first celebrated, but the British Isles have been inhabited by Celtic peoples since at least 600 BC, so it could be very, very old. All Saints Day, on the other hand, has only been celebrated since the 4th century AD. And then there's the fact that Halloween is celebrated on October 31st, but both Samhain and All Saints Day are November 1st. Despite the fact that Samhain would start on October 31st for us, due to the Celtic concept of time and dividing the day into the light half and the dark half, rather than the way we do it currently, which is kind of the, the middle of the night and the middle of the day, you had this situation where our October 31st is their November 1st. So that may seem open and shut. Clearly, we just took the date and took all the pagan stuff out and made it about Christianity. It's not that simple. As I said, All Saints Day was first celebrated in the 4th century when Christianity was just beginning to get its sea legs. 
it had only become legal to be a Christian in Rome after the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, which ended decades of persecution of the Christians. And yes, that is decades, not centuries. Christianity wasn't a big enough problem for the Romans to care until the 200s. And by a problem, I mean the Christians refused to recognize the emperor as a god among men, which oftentimes got them uh, executed. And if you're wondering why this treatment was only extended to the Christians and not the Jews, it's because of the way that Christianity and Judaism differed at the time. In Judaism, you would make sacrifices to God. Christianity, Christ was the sacrifice. So the Jews got around it by agreeing with the Romans that they would make sacrifices to their God on behalf of the Roman emperor. And the Romans kind of said, okay, that's close enough. The Christians, on the other hand, refused to sacrifice anything. So the Romans basically weren't okay with it for that reason. There are a number of other issues with it, but that's a video for Weird Bible or History Hut, not Lore Lodge. But anyway, all of that persecution meant lots of martyrs, and once Christianity was legal, they wanted to remember them. They wanted to honor the martyrs. And so, All Saints Day was born on May 13th in Edessa, in Syria. Not long after that, in 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea kind of created the first standardized version of Christianity. They didn't create a biblical canon yet, but they did agree on several important theological points, including the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A little while later, the Orthodox and the Catholics would argue about the Holy Spirit and whether he was uh, both the Father and the Son or just the Father, and that caused a whole schism. Again, other video. And once again, I'm not saying that was the only thing that caused the schism. Just in case. <laughs> Christianity was kind of on a roll here, though, because it became legal in 313 AD, standardized in 325 AD, and then was the official state religion of Rome in 380 AD, after the, uh, the Edict of Thessalonica. And when I say it became the state religion in Rome, that doesn't necessarily mean that the other religions became outlawed, it just meant that the Roman state stopped funding the other cults. And I'm not using cult in the terminology that it's a, a dark and mysterious shadowy group who worship a, a human who has convinced them that they're God. I'm talking about cult as in the actual, the cult of a deity. So the cult of Dionysus, the cult of Jupiter, the cult of uh, Aphrodite. That is how you would re refer to these things. Technically, Christianity would be the cult of Jesus Christ. And with the evolution of Christianity, we had the evolution of the Christian holidays like Christmas and All Saints Day. All Saints Day, starting in 400 AD, at least in Northern Italy, at the urging of Saint Maximus of Turin, began to be celebrated the Sunday after Pentecost. So this would have put All Saints Day in the middle of May, and this also extended to parts of Southern Germany. It wasn't just Turin. All Saints Day may have been celebrated in Britain during this time, but we don't know for sure. It was heavily Christian at that point, but it was also heavily Celtic. Also, All Saints Day was not a universal church holiday yet. It was something that was kind of preached by the priests and bishops who supported it. Now, if Britain was primarily Christian by the time of the Roman withdrawal in 410 AD, Ireland was the opposite. It only started to develop into a Christian country, or a Christian region more so, around the late 5th century. Once St. Patrick and Palladius got over there, they started the process and it really got rolling. A little while later, on May 13th, 609 or 610, Pope Boniface IV consecrated the Pantheon as a church dedicated to Mary and the Martyrs. He also ordered a feast held in honor of this consecration, which has become known as the Feast of St. Mary and the Martyrs and is held on May 13th in the Catholic faith. And if you're looking at that saying, oh, how could they do that? How could they repurpose the Pantheon? That was something the Romans loved to do. The Romans loved to repurpose other people's religions into their own. This practice of absorbing other people's deities and religious buildings into your own religion was very common across medieval and ancient Europe. The first time we get anywhere near November 1st for All Saints Day is the dedication of an oratory to all the saints and martyrs. This would have been in 732, but whether or not it was on November 1st is a matter of dispute. Some sources say that Pope Gregory III made this dedication on April 12th, 732, with November 1st actually being an anti-iconoclast synod. Really quickly, iconoclasm was the belief that images of Christ, images of Mary, things like that were akin to idolatry and therefore not allowed in the church, and they must be destroyed. The Catholics did not agree with this. There were several iconoclast controversies throughout Christian history, and this was just one of them. If it was just an iconoclast synod held on that date, it would have had absolutely no connection to Samhain. 
But interestingly enough, as churches on the mainland were celebrating All Saints Day on May 13th, again, it was more of a day of obligation, it was a feast day, it wasn't an official Catholic holiday, but as they were celebrating it on the 13th of May, churches in Scotland, Ireland, and Northumbria began to celebrate it on November 1st. This must have begun sometime before the 790s as Alcuin of Northumbria, as well as, and I'm gonna butcher these pronunciations, the martyrologies of Talit and Engus, which both mention a feast of all the departed saints on November 1st at that time. Alcuin seems to have made a deliberate attempt to change the date of All Saints Day to November 1st, and decades after his death, he actually managed to succeed. Alcuin had been very, very influential at the court of the Frankish king, and Louis the Pious decided that he would change the date in Francia to November 1st in 835 AD, and then he was able to convince Pope Gregory IV to do the same for all Christians, or at the very least, for all Catholics. At this point in time, the schism between the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches was not completed yet. They definitely were rocky, and they had been in some disputes, but the Great Schism had not yet occurred. And that is basically to say that the Pope and the Patriarch of Constantinople had not yet excommunicated one another. And to be excommunicated means that you're no longer in communion with the Church and therefore can't go to heaven or perform rites or anything like that, which is a pretty big deal. Now, whether or not the Pope has the power to do that or the Patriarch has the power to do that isn't really biblical, but that's not the point. So as we can see, All Saints Day began to materialize long before Christians had ever heard of Samhain. And more importantly, it, it started in Syria which is very far away from Ireland. Now, at the beginning of this video, we asked a question. Was Halloween originally a pagan holiday? Answering that required that we define what Halloween is today and then follow all of the traditions back to their roots. Trick-or-treating was first as the tradition with the oldest documentation. Because no evidence of this practice exists prior to Christianity, it seems like it's likely a natural evolution of going from parish to parish asking for soul cakes. And then it was jack-o'-lanterns, that iconic symbol of Halloween. These went to the pagans because it seems to come from the same stock as Will-o'-the-wisps, and therefore the Fey Folk, which are not a concept in most of Christianity. In Irish and Scottish Christianity, there's a little bit more wiggle room for them, but in most of Western Christianity, no fairies. Do I personally think that Christianity excludes fairies? Not really. Depends on how you define fairy, I guess. <laughs> Costumes were tough, and we called that one a draw because it seemed like it was neither pagan nor Christian, just Scottish considering the Scottish affinity for pranks and jokes, and uh, what was known as the Jinx, it seems quite possible, and really makes sense, that this was the origin of the trick part of trick-or-treating. You know, back in the day before you had law enforcement, uh, people, people actually would, if you did not give them a treat, play a trick. Uh, <laughs> and if you were one of these Scottish older teenagers or young adults, playing your trick, you probably wouldn't want people to recognize you, and you'd probably wear a mask. And then we have the date, which was a little less cut and dry of an answer. Based simply on the history of the Catholic Church, it would not surprise me at all if Alcuin of Northumbria was harping on November 1st as the date for All Saints Day to make it easier for the recently pagan Irish and Scots to be comfortable with this holiday. On the other hand, the tradition of All Saints Day dates to a period before Christianity spread to Ireland. So that means that trick-or-treating is Christian, jack-o'-lanterns are pagan, costumes are just Scottish, and the dates were originally different. But at the root of it all is a simple fact that answers the entire question. Only one of these holidays is about the dead. Samhain is a harvest festival that may have doubled as the Celtic New Year. All Saints Day is a celebration of the saints and martyrs and an honoring of the dead. The reason that there may have been this confusion around Samhain being a Celtic holiday regarding the dead may have been because Christians couldn't wrap their heads around the idea of the other world back in the Middle Ages. Because for them, you had our world, you had heaven, purgatory, and hell. So there was our world and the afterlife. We could not, while living, go to purgatory, heaven, or hell. Now, there are certain cases in the Bible in which people do exactly that, but it's not something that is common and something that only happens when God himself plucks you up and says, you're coming with me. Or if not God, one of his angels. So Christians didn't have this idea of a, a parallel dimension inhabited by people like us with supernatural abilities. They just had this life and the afterlife, which may have led early scholars to think, oh, that must be a festival of the dead because spirits come over from the other world. They must be dead. No. So at the end of the day, they're not the same holiday because they're celebrating completely different things. 
and yet Halloween somehow seems to be both. And that's because it is. Sure, it's a Christian holiday, All Hallows' Eve, but the date comes from Celtic tradition, and the celebration seems to be a mix of the two. So Halloween is neither All Saints' Day nor Samhain. It's a secret third option. A really cool, harmless, and fun mix of two holidays. You may have some fundamentalist Christians out there telling you that Halloween is worship of the devil, and if you even so much as dress up in a costume or ride on a hay bale through a cornfield, you are worshiping Satan. And there are neo-pagans who will tell you that Christians simply stole a Celtic holiday, and in reality, you are actually worshiping our gods, ha ha, or, you know, stop celebrating our holiday, depending on who you're talking to. In reality, both groups are completely wrong. Or at least in my opinion, both groups are completely wrong. I think I laid out a pretty good case. Realistically, you can celebrate any of these holidays. If you're a Christian, you probably shouldn't celebrate Samhain. If you're a pagan, celebrating All Saints Day doesn't really make any sense. The good news is, all of us can come together and enjoy a non-religious festival of the fall season on October 31st without insulting our respective faiths. And I personally, as a human being who has to live in a society, like that option. And if you like that option too, you can support us here at the Lore Lodge by subscribing on our Patreon for just $1 a month. You can also check out our other channels, The Weird Bible, The History Hut, The Lore Lounge, and my personal channel, Aiden Mattis, where we do some more live streaming stuff, and that's kind of commentary, gaming, uh, music, that kind of thing. We also have a podcast that goes live usually at 7 p.m. on Sundays. If not, it's usually 8 p.m. on Sundays or 7 p.m. on Mondays. Good news is it's always on Spotify on Tuesday. And aside from Spotify, it's also on Apple Music, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, and basically anywhere you get your podcasts. We also have merch, so you can feel like you're wearing our skin when you're not. And you can get that merch at thelorelodge.shop. If you feel like you have trouble staying awake during our videos, it's clearly not because I'm boring, it's because you're not getting enough sleep. So try out our coffee from Tableau Roasting Co., Mount Pocono Perk. And if you want to keep up and get updates, you can check out our Discord at bit.ly slash join the lodge. We'd also like to thank Mindgrasp AI for sponsoring this video. You can check them out via the links in our description and comments. With all of that said, I am Aiden Mattis, and thank you for stopping by the Lore Lodge.